uh, into dealing with two different um, topics, essentially. So the first topic is uh, mine, and I'll get started with my talk. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Yep. Thank you. So the topic of my talk is integrating the pieces together for managing fusarium head blight of wheat and barley. So let's talk about some of the diseases. As I am a pathologist, I, I will be dealing with pathologist uh, with disease issues of small grains. So let's talk about the problematic uh, diseases in the mid-Atlantic region uh, of small grains. So first and foremost is fusarium head blight, uh, which is a fungal disease. And as you can see in this picture, there are some wheat heads or wheat spikes, which are bleached. And uh, these, these are the typical symptoms of fusarium head blight. Then we also uh, sporadically get a stripe rust, which is again a fungal disease. Uh, it does not affect wheat heads, but it drastically reduces yield because of the compromised photosynthetic efficiency of the diseased leaves. Powdery mildew appears uh, early in the season, and it also uh, can lead to yield losses, um, although there are control options, good control options available for powdery mildew. And then barley yellow dwarf is another disease of uh, concern in our region. Uh, it's not a fungal disease, it's a viral disease. Uh, and the typical symptoms are yellowing and stunting of plants, as you can see here. So I work on uh, two of these diseases, fusarium head blight and stripe rust, uh, but I've started working a little bit on these other powdery mildew and barley yellow dwarf also. Uh, but today's talk will be focused on mostly fusarium head blight. Uh, so this picture I showed in my previous slide as well. Uh, and as you can see around 20% of the uh, heads in this field is this in this plot are bleached, um, showing the attack of fusarium graminearum, the causal pathogen of fusarium head blight. Not only are the spikes bleached, but also the seeds are highly shriveled, as you can see in this picture on the uh, bottom right. Uh, this pile on the left hand side shows uh, fusarium damaged kernels, and on the right hand side, the seeds, the normal healthy looking seeds, these are. Uh, obviously, the healthy seed, they are not scabby. But this is a drastic comparison between uh, scabby kernels or fusarium damaged kernels, uh, which you can appreciate directly will affect significantly the yield. Not only uh, they are a direct uh, challenge to the yield and production, but also these grains are associated with mycotoxins, uh, majorly deoxin, evalenol, or DON. It's also known as vomitoxin. And this is the only disease of all these diseases that I talked about previously, that uh, if your crop is infected with uh, Dawn or Fusarium graminearum, uh, then this is a direct uh, factor which will, uh, which will compromise the quality or safety of your grain. So this disease is therefore of the most significance, uh, particularly in this region, and I'll talk about why. Um, this is particularly challenging in the mid-Atlantic region. So this picture uh, actually uh, is from a fusarium head blight misted nursery setup in Kansas from where I came uh, during my postdoc, I was at K-State. And this picture actually is from Maryland from my own misted nursery. And as you can um, very well appreciate here, the previous picture had only 20% of the heads which were bleached. Whereas in this picture, it's 100% uh, spikes are bleached. So you, this is a Maryland picture, as I mentioned before. So this is where um, the significance of fusarium head blight uh, is highlighted. Uh, so why it is more uh, of such a big concern in Maryland? Uh, it's because um, we oftentimes, as you know, we are a wet state. In the spring season, when wheat is flowering, which is the most susceptible stage for attack by this fusarium graminearum, the pathogen, uh, when wheat is flowering and pathogen is attacking and also it's spring uh, wet season, uh, so that is very conducive for the growth and survival of the pathogen. 
So if it's a spring and wet and warm temperature, the pathogen is very happy and it quickly the disease turns into an epidemic. And this picture actually is uh, from 2018, where if you remember 2018 was a very wet season. And in fact, uh, some farmers lost up to more than 50% of their yields because of uh, fusarium head blight, because all the, they could not uh, spray any fungicides or the grains that they harvested were heavily contaminated with dawn. Uh, another reason is that as we practice no-till agriculture, and it's a good soil conservation practice, but it leads to uh, a heavy inoculum load in the soil because corn, generally the crop which is rot rotated with wheat, that is also a host of fusarium graminearum and it is infected with fusarium graminearum and then the stubble serves as a reservoir of inoculum for the wheat crop. Uh, so that does not help either with managing fusarium head blight. And the other bottleneck in uh, management of fusarium head blight is that most of the varieties, the resistant varieties that are available uh, commercially uh, do not have a high level of resistance. So only a little bit of quantitative uh, resistance is available in cultivated varieties. Of course, this uh, factor is not limited only to uh, Maryland, but uh, it adds to the problems of uh, fusarium head blight management in Maryland. So this picture uh, on the right here shows a map of uh, Maryland and Delaware um, during May uh, 2018. And in fact, it's one of my job responsibilities also to advise farmers about what are the risks of fusarium head blight due to uh, weather conditions in a particular year and uh, provide uh, live commentaries to every uh, region um, of Maryland uh, uh, to help uh, the farmers in managing it effectively. So I'll talk a little bit about the work or the various pieces about which I said in my title, I'll be integrating those all pieces to map towards finally effectively managing fusarium at blight. So I'll talk about the pieces, uh, but before that, um, my program, my research program is divided into two uh, sections. One deals with the basic research components of uh, plant diseases, and the other one deals with more farmer oriented or the applied aspects of my research. So these are the uh, broad areas uh, or broad goals of the basic research component of my program. So first of all, uh, one of the major focus areas in the lab is to find new sources of resistance genes. As I mentioned that not uh, very high levels of genetic resistance sources are available for fusarium at blight. So this is uh, uh, a bottleneck and I'm trying to uh, solve this problem by scanning a lot of genetic resources, germ plasma, I'll share a little bit of information on that. And then the other thing that I've recently started doing is uh, finding dispensable susceptibility factors in plants. It's, it's uh, emerging areas in basic research and I'm um, kind of spearheading uh, research in that direction um, for fusarium and blight. And then ultimately I map and identify these um, genes or these negative regulators and also develop diagnostic molecular markers. So the ultimate goal is to find new sources and deploy them in, uh, in commercial varieties in the region. And for that, we heavily collaborate with um, the breeder, small grain breeder at Maryland. Uh, and the idea is to develop a pipeline where I can quickly screen the genetic diversity and find good sources, promising sources of resistance, and then can deliver those sources to the breeder and he can incor incorporate those sources uh, into his breeding varieties. And then the downstream work that um, involves characterization of genes or mechanistic studies of the genes, that's also a uh, basic goal of the program, but I'll not be dealing about these two aspects uh, today in this talk. And then uh, the second component, as I mentioned in my program, is to do uh, applied research for uh, farmers to solve their fusarium head blight challenge. So, and I'm doing it in a multi-pronged uh, strategy. So the first strategy is, uh, as I mentioned before, providing FHB risk forecast to growers. And it's uh, done in a coordinated network actually across uh, the US. And I'll tell you how I'm doing it. 
in my next few slides, but um, also I'll be talking about, uh, I also test uh, resistance levels of commercial cultivars. And I conduct these tests in my misted nursery at Bellsville uh, Farm uh, facility of uh, the University of Maryland. And then the results are provided to the farmer so that they can make informed decisions for their planting um, in the next seasons. Also, I test new chemical control options as they are, they are rolled out or in their early phases of uh, commercialization and so that we have a, a, a knowledge um, of cost benefit and also the efficacy of those fungicides for use by farmers. Uh, recently, I've also started collaborating on R&D of some uh, chemicals or uh, new metabolites um, the, with the ultimate idea of controlling FHB. And in addition to that, I provide research-based solutions to growers' queries. Um, anything that comes my way, I try to solve those. Uh, so the first aspect about which I'll be talking is uh, finding new sources of resistance genes. So as I mentioned, I have a lot of, uh, I have a big collection that I maintain at uh, uh, my gene bank uh, at UMD. And there I have more than 30,000 wheat lines that involve um, germplasm, uh, mutant populations, wild relatives, cultivars, land races from different parts of the world. And then I have some triticale uh, collections of around 1,000 individuals, accession numbers, and then some barley, uh, around 800 lines of global barley collection. So the idea is to screen everything that I have in my gene bank, uh, and sieve it through um, my misted nursery to find good potential donors of useful genes for using in Maryland cultivars. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the misted nursery. And we, what we do is we inoculate our field with infected corn kernels and um, we let them let the plants grow. We mist these nurseries heavily so that not only high density of the population of pathogen is supplied, but also uh, very high humidity conditions are maintained there for optimal survival and spread of the pathogen. And this is the result that we get. Sometimes we also have to use bird deterrents and it's because the corn that we uh, use for inoculating a nursery is sometimes eaten away by the, by the birds and other <laughs> pests in these nurseries. So this picture here uh, shows uh, the results of one such screening. And as you can see, all these uh, lines, these are wild relatives of wheat, so they don't look as good as uh, commercial varieties. But the idea is to just test everything um, under high disease pressure conditions. And as you can see in the background, whatever is visible is bleached. Uh, whereas this particular plot uh, shows green spikes, showing that it has some genes which are providing it resistance. Uh, this is another uh, picture. Um, and these two hedgerows, as you can see, are very different from the background uh, bleached heads here. Uh, so these are being, uh, I have already given these, this material to the small grain breeder here, and he's now trying to incorporate the genes and find those genes uh, for use in the varieties. Then whatever genetic diversity we found, uh, we find with a large screen in the field uh, level testing. We also uh, test it in greenhouse conditions just to make sure that uh, uh, there was no disease escape uh, and that being termed as resistance, false resistance, because in greenhouse we can point inoculate everything and make sure that there is no escape or um, optimal conditions are maintained. So this was the first project. And the second thing is um, uh, finding dispensable susceptibility factors. So for that, uh, this is one of the projects uh, um, in this direction. And what we did here was that I had a big tilling population of more than 1,000 uh, mutant lines, which I screened in my misted nursery again. And then uh, this was done in 2018, 2019. This you can see is a misted nursery setup. And everything was planted in hedgerows. And then um, we scored the resistance uh, levels of all these um, lines. And we found around 74 lines to have low disease severity. 
and also um, 21 out of these lines had lower dawn values. So this was very promising. Then we selected these lines and we tested them again in the greenhouse conditions and we found that eight genotypes had very, very low FHB severity as well as dawn content after 21 days. So now, the, uh, so this is a picture of some of the spikes from our greenhouse testing. And as you can see, this is a, jag this is a wild type plant, no mutations here, and it is completely bleached after 21 days. Whereas these, some of the uh, uh, spikes of these uh, lines are pretty green, showing that they have some uh, something knocked out in them, which makes the plants more resistant. So uh, talking about the fusarium head blight risk forecast to growers, um, why is it so important? Uh, because as I mentioned before, it's uh, we always have wet and warm spring season. Uh, this is actually uh, the risk map, FHB risk map, for May, um, mostly when it when wheat is flowering here in this region, May and June in 2020. And as you can see, this uh, is our state, Maryland, and this is Delaware. Uh, so the risk is not constant throughout the season. For example, this picture is taken from, um, was taken on May 10th, and the state looks pretty um, orange. Whereas on May 17th, uh, because the weather, uh, the uh, rain stopped, so the uh, risks decreased. So it's important to know how the weather is and what are the risks actually on field level. So now the good thing about this uh, uh, new version of the FHB risk map, and it is a coordinated uh, project again with K-State uh, and U.S. Wheat Barley Scab Initiative, Penn State, uh, that they give, um, they, we can zoom up to county level even so that we can even uh, see the in risks of uh, fusarium head blight in the season on each day uh, in different counties of our states. So as you can see, the risk keeps on changing. And on May 31, our entire states, well, both the states, Maryland and Delaware, were pretty uh, high in their fusarium head blight risk. And it all depends on the weather condition, how moist it is and how warm it is. And uh, that's how the these uh, risk assessments are done. Um, this is again uh, June, it, the state is again still orange and then it decreased further. But the majority of our um, uh, wheat flowers during the uh, third or fourth week of May, which was actually uh, pretty uh, orange here, so showing a higher disease risk. But uh, the goal of my, uh, my recommendations or my uh, announcements here is, first of all, to advise farmers if their wheat is flowering, they should consider spray or not in that particular county. And also, uh, what are the proper ways or what are the proper chemistries? Because not everything suits all the diseases. So uh, it has to be very tailored to the specific problem about which uh, farmers are worried. For example, if fusarium head blight involves different sets of chemistries and leaf rust or uh, uh, powdery mildew or other diseases. Now, the fourth project about which I'll be talking briefly is uh, testing genetic resistance levels of commercial varieties. It is one of the most important deliverable from my program to the farmers. And as uh, I mentioned before, I conduct the Mr. Nursery. So here I, um, I conduct triplicate testing of uh, around 70 to 80 commercial varieties that the farmers uh, uh, have access to and they are interested in uh, seeing what is resistant and what is not. Uh, and also I've started recently screening barley lines in them. And the uh, output of these, uh, this exercise is uh, provided to the farmers in terms of fact sheets. And these are used heavily by the farmers for making planting decisions. Um, because most of the farmers in our region want uh, fusarium head blight resistant varieties. So this is a picture of uh, 2019 fusarium head blight uh, screening nursery fact sheet. And as you can see, some of the lines were moderately resistant. Uh, some were moderately susceptible and a lot of them were highly susceptible. Uh, 
I also uh, try new chemical control options as they are made available by companies or in their early uh, period of release. So for example, uh, since 2018, I've been uh, working with this uh, new product from uh, Syngenta Miravis Ace. And it's a new chemistry and uh, it's a little bit costly. So the farmers are interested in knowing how much efficacious is it? Is it worth to pay some extra bucks for uh, getting it uh, sprayed, is it that good? So that was a goal of this exercise and uh, we tested um, this uh, product in 2017, 2018 first before its commercialization. And we saw that it, it was providing actually a comparable level of resistance uh, to the standard, uh, the standard fungicides, Prosaro and Peramba that are used currently for managing fusarium blight. Uh, now, one, one more claim that the company makes is that uh, Miravis Ace can spread the window of uh, fungicide spray because if you remember, I said that the most susceptible stage for fusarium head blight attack is flowering, but uh, Miravis Ace is claimed to uh, provide resistance even if it is sprayed at this stage, then 50% of the head is out of the boot. Uh, so this is a very tall claim and it actually will improve the management um, efficacy of any fungicide program if it's used by farmers. Uh, so we tested this. Uh, we haven't received the results of 2020 tests, so I am not showing them here, but in 2019, we found that actually Miravis Ace does seem to provide a decent level of control on 50% um, head emergence um, stage as well. Uh, so one another project, uh, is actually a very recent development um, where we are trying to test a nematode metabolite for its uh, potential to fight fusarium head blight. And actually it's a NSF SBIR funded project. Uh, so this product uh, from uh, nematodes was tested for uh, their efficacy in making the plants resistant against um, multiple crops. So this picture here was actually the cover page image of uh, Phytophthora soji infection on soybean. And as you can see, the left hand side is the untreated control, and on the right hand side uh, is the effect of the metabolite. So um, the idea is to test this um, metabolite for its uh, potential uh, in management of fusarium head blight. And it will be especially useful to organic wheat growers because they cannot really use the commercial fungicides that are available for managing this disease. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the most important aspects is also to provide research-based solutions to growers' queries. And uh, I, I get some very interesting questions um, during the wheat growing season or even before that uh, about uh, what farmers can do. Uh, and the range is very interesting. It ranges from which variety should I plant for minimizing risk of fusarium head blight to um, Am I, I am an organic wheat grower, what are my FHB control options? Or how can I spray fungicides if it is raining? So these are some very interesting questions, some of which I don't know the answers of. So for that, I have to research myself and uh, uh, then I come to the uh, informed conclusions, investi well investigated conclusion and I share my results with the farmers. So that was my last slide. Um, it was a very brief overview of the various things I, that I'm doing. I don't think that the um, time was sufficient to investigate in, and to present in detail what exactly I'm doing and what exactly I'm finding, but that was just a bird's eye view. Uh, I am thankful to all the funding sources uh, for supporting my various uh, um, efforts towards managing fusarium head blight. And uh, this is a last year's picture of my group. So this year we could not, we could not go anywhere outside because of COVID. Uh, there are some new faces um, added to these old ones now. And that was the last slide. With that, I would be very happy to answer any questions if you have. All right, Nitty, you only have one question. Uh, does Fusarium only piggyback off corn residue or does it piggyback off soybean residue as well? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, mostly it's corn. Yeah, the results are 
more severe when you fall when wheat follows corn, but uh, soybean is not a primary host of this pathogen, so it uh, it cannot be used by the pathogen as worse as as it can be you as corn can be used. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right, Alyssa, are you ready? All right, I am. All right, good morning. Um, is, are you able to see everything okay? Yes. All right, wonderful. Well, I hope everyone's doing well today. Um, my name is Alyssa Kaler and I'm the Field Crops Extension Plant Pathologist with the University of Delaware. And today I'll be talking to you about an overview of uh, some of our work in corn and soybeans. I'm going to begin today talking about a few grad student projects that have developed over the past year or two, um, specifically looking at Pythium. So I have two students, uh, John Bickle and Madeline Henriksen, that are working on this. And today I'll share a little bit of their work, um, some things that are um, results from this year and then some ongoing questions. So I arrived here in Delaware in 2018 that fall, um, but it was a very wet year. There was a lot of moisture in the spring and come 2019, it was still pretty wet. And so one of the early problems that, um, you know, I ended up in a lot of fields where there were high moisture scenarios and we had a lot of corn um, that was showing symptoms of pythium damping off. And so this opened up a few questions for us to wonder, um, so pythium is one of those organisms where that's the name of a genus, but there's actually lots of species within pythium. So there's many different types of pythium. And we have never really looked at what type of pythiums we have here in the mid-Atlantic. Um, one of the questions for this is that some seed treatments work better on some species than others. So we were trying to understand, um, you know, we, we were seeing some great stands emerging and then getting this post-emergence damping off. So was it just that we got pythium infection after this window where the seed treatment was working? Or, you know, do we have species that maybe um, aren't working as well against some of our seed treatments? And this really leads to one of the big questions uh, that I get a lot is how does early season pythium really impact the overall yield potential of that field? Um, do we need to consider replanting? Are plants gonna grow out of it? And those are some of the questions that we worked on answering um, over the past year or so. So when we have pythium early season in the field, um, we typically see these symptoms that come uh, right where you have that seed that's um, kind of emerging out, we'll see a brown necrotic area, and that's where that pythium has kind of infected. And in some cases, um, it will totally decapitate the plant, like you can see in this one image. So that plant is done for the season. It's not going to grow out of it. But then there are cases where the corn plant's able to set new roots and somewhat grow out of this pythium infection. And I have some pictures that I'll be sharing later of a project where we're actually tracking plants through the season to try to understand what these plants grow up to look like. So from some of our work so far, what we've found is we have a lot of different pythium species here in the area. Um, when I think about pythium species, sometimes I, I kind of relate it to, if you think about breeds of dogs, so everything's grouped as a dog, but you might have different types. You know, you have your sled dogs, you have your labs, you have your schnauzers and your Pomeranians. Although they're all dogs, each one is going to act a little different. Um, you know, some are going to like to live outside in the cold. Some are going to be more favoring the warmth. And pythiums are kind of the same way. So we have some pythiums that are going to favor cold weather. They're going to be there in the early planted corn with the cool season. Um, but then we're also going to have pythiums that are favored by warmth. Some of these pythiums also vary in the way that they respond to fungicides. And one way that we're able to look at this in the lab is to actually set up some in vitro plate assays where we have amended um, media where we put fungicide in. And we did a small scale study um, back in the spring where we started to look at about 15 isolates that represented five of these different species that we found here in the mid-Atlantic. 
And what we do is we put in different parts per million from absolutely no fungicide down um, up to, in this particular case, uh, 10 parts per million. So in this graph that you see here, this red line is indicating the Y equals 50. So what we're looking for is what is the amount of fungicide needed that will inhibit half of the growth of this organism? And we were looking at three products, um, Illumin and Apron XL, which have been out for a while, and then also a new product, Viantis, which we're hoping will maybe come to market in 2021, but I haven't heard updates if you know, COVID and everything has thrown that um, trajectory off at all. But what we were looking at was comparing these different species. And what you can see from this graph is that the Viantis actually did a great job. Um, even at our very lowest rate, it was nearly 100% control. So we actually weren't able to create an EV50 value for that one. We'll need to go back in at lower levels. Um, but with the Illumin and the Apron XL, we were able to create those ED50 values um, or EC50 effective concentration or effective dose to inhibit half that growth. And what we found in this is that we did have some variation among these Pythium species. So this Pythium coloratum was not inhibited quite as much as some of our others. Um, but um, as I mentioned, we did have a lot of promise out of that Viantis. Um, this was sort of a preliminary trial, um, one that we'll be continuing with more species and more isolates and a few additional products this winter. Um, but it was promising, especially with this new one, that maybe there's some things on the horizon that we can incorporate into our seed treatments uh, to try to help us with some of that early season Pythium infection. This year in the field, one of our big questions was, okay, if we have this early season Pythium infection, what are these plants growing up to look like? Um, so in some fields this season, what we did, we marked off uh, one 1,000th one acre sections and we took beginning of season stain counts and basically any plants that looked like they may have had Pythium, a lot of times the tip off for a plant that has Pythium is stunting. Um, so it may be a few growth stages behind. Um, of course, you know, if you had uneven emergence, there can be other factors that lead to this, but in a field that had pretty even emergence, um, usually one of the signs of Pythium will be some of this stunting. Uh, so we marked these symptomatic plants and flagged them and basically came back throughout the whole season looking at them. And we created these series of paired tests where we had a plant that was pretty symptomatic and showing Pythium symptoms and then had a healthy plant that was beside it. Um, and we partnered with Dr. Erin Sparks, who is another faculty in my department, and she works with looking at metrics of uh, plant biomechanics. And so we used this piece of equipment called the Darling, and what it does is it, it pushes against the corn stalk, and it, it lets it know kind of how much um, tension it's able to have and gives some indication of how strong that corn plant is. Um, I have a few videos here just to show you how this works. So we went in and took mid-season ratings where we pushed but didn't take the plant to failure. And then at the end of season, when we were ready to destructively sample, then we'll actually take that corn plant to the point that it snaps and it gives us some values that we can compare. Um, this is another little device here on the right side that's called a Smurf um, for a sorghum maze um, rotation device. And this is another one that we measured at end of season. And it gives some indication of learning about both the roots and some of the uh, stalk strength. So the really neat thing that came out of this project, um, if you look at this map on the right side, so the darling, when we measured it early, um, we didn't really know if Pythium was gonna respond differently than the control. We thought there might be some early season differences, but it ended up being really striking um, you know, big different, big jump between the control plant and the Pythium plants. Um, in every case, the Pythium plant had a weaker stock than the control. Um, and by the end of the season, the overall stiffness is reduced now that, you know, those plants have put ears out, um, there's kind of less going on in the stock itself. But we still saw that difference between the control plant and the Pythium plant. And as we were doing these destructive samples, we were bringing plants back, weighing roots, looking at ears, looking at um, widths of stalks. And it really was quite striking the differences between these um, Pythium infected plants and the, the healthy control plant beside it. 
So you can see um, from these plants, there was a big difference in the top line is showing our Pythium images. So we had a much um, reduced weight in the Pythium roots and these ears didn't fill out as well, um, had a much lower potential yield. Um, so there were a few cases where this was similar. This was uh, one of the closest pairings where we estimated that Pythium corn had about a 213 bushel ear potential there versus a 250 in the control. Um, but most of them unfortunately looked more like this set of where we had basically a non-existent ear um, making hardly any yield. And we had a few cases where the plant was pretty piddly and didn't even put on an ear at all. Um, so, you know, I get asked that question in springtime a lot of like, okay, this plant has Pythium. Am I gonna be okay? Am I gonna grow out of it? And I was hoping from this that there would actually, you know, be not quite as dramatic of differences as what we saw here. Uh, but really what we're seeing is that that early season Pythium really is taking a hit on yield potential of that plant. So it comes down to how much Pythium is in the field. You know, is it a small spot or is it really widespread? In which case it may be worth um, considering a, a replant if you have a lot of that post-emergent stamping off and some of these symptoms. So what we saw from this year was that we do have multiple piece, species of Pythium that are associated with damping off of corn in our region. And when we get this early season infection, it really is decreasing the overall stand. Um, then we're also seeing that the plants that survive and, and grow out of it, even though they're still surviving, they're gonna have those lower stalk strengths, smaller roots and smaller ears. Now, another piece of the puzzle that we've been looking at is um, plants that grow really well all season, uh, but then get this accelerated senescence. So you may have seen this in a field where you're walking through, it's green plant, green plant, green plant. All of a sudden there's one that's already brown, the ears dropped. And one of our questions going into this season was wondering if those early season Pythium plants were sort of predisposing plants um, for this accelerated senescence. But what we found in every case where we had plants flagged with early season Pythium, they didn't have this accelerated senescence. And we ended up doing some of those push tests and other metrics on some of the accelerated plants we did observe. And what we found with those is that they had well-formed root systems, but they were predisposed to having stalk rots. And in pretty much every case, we did get Pythium out of the root system. So it seems that there may be um, kind of this early season Pythium window, but also a mid season Pythium window that we need to keep um, an eye on. And we'll see if technology will cooperate with me today, but um, since I can't see your hands raised to ask, I have a poll question that I'd like to try to launch um, to just out of curiosity, if you think you've observed this accelerated senescence in corn in recent seasons, um, you can respond with yes, no, or possibly, but weren't exactly looking for it. All right, it looks like most people have got a vote in, so we'll give it just one or two more seconds. If you haven't had a chance to enter, go ahead. No right or wrong answer, just curious um, if anyone has been seeing this. All right, so um, hopefully you're able to see the results there. So about 31% have seen this, 14% no, and 55 possibly, but wasn't looking for it. So thank you, um, appreciate your, your feedback there. I also noticed in the chat, there was a question of the best fungicide treatment that is um, available today on market for Pythium. Um, that is one that, so even, Though we use fungicides, Pythium isn't actually a true fungus, it's an oomycete. So when we think about treating Pythium, that's why not everything works on Pythium. Um, so for years, uh, methanoxum and, and metalaxyl type products have really been what we've relied upon. 
Um, the downside of that is when you use the same thing for a long time, you, you can get resistance. Um, that's part of what we're looking at in the um, pleat assays that we're doing is to see if we have resistance in any of our isolates. So far, um, we haven't had any that were strongly resistant. So it, it does seem like that's still working for the region. Um, so I'd say, you know, that has been sort of the number one product um, that has the um, best efficacy against Pythium. Um, but hopefully there's a few new things on the horizon that will give us a couple other tools in the toolbox. Um, and, and when we talk about Pythium, you know, we can also get damping off from Rhizoctonia, which is a true fungus. Um, and, in, and especially in other systems, um, not only corn, but, but other systems as well. That's just to keep an eye on uh, what product you're using and what it says it's active on, because not everything is active on Pythium. So just keep an eye on the label when you're looking for those. All right. Um, so moving away from um, some of our, our root type diseases, I'm, I'm going to switch gears and we're going to move to some of the foliar pressures in corn. And gray leaf spot um, is our most common foliar disease that we see from year to year. It has these very characteristic um, rectangular lesions. These start out maybe one to three inches, but they can join together if we have um, good humid environments, lots of rain. Um, you know, with a lot of our irrigated systems and corn on corn, it really creates the perfect environment to have a lot of gray leaf spot in our region. Um, and so one of my uh, you know, trials that I run every year is looking at fungicide performance for gray leaf spot. And I'm gonna move through a couple slides here. Um, they're all set up pretty similar. Um, so on this left side, you can see the fungicide treatments that we were testing. Um, for the percent gray leaf spot incidence, what we're looking at there is the ear leaf. And for incidence, we're looking at, does it have lesions or not? Um, so that's early on um, to kind of tell a difference of if there was disease or not. Once we start having disease that moves in on everything, we also take a rating of severity. So how much of that ear leaf was covered in those gray leaf spot lesions? So in this particular trial, uh, this is one that was at our Georgetown site. And so this was irrigated corn that was in a rotated field. And we had gray leaf spot ratings at 14, 28, and 42 days after application. So down here at the bottom, you can see our control. Um, and it had the most disease. And all of our fungicide products that we were screening had um, disease control um, that was uh, reducing disease over having um, no fungicide applied to it. We also were taking a measure of um, this canapeo green cover was just sort of a way to capture how much green leaf area was still there. Um, and we did see some uh, differences in that one as well. Um, if we take a look at yield, our control in this plot was running at about 218 bushel. Um, and we had um, some of our treatments into the 230s um, and with our best one here at 232. Um, I know that it's, it's kind of tough since I can't see everybody and see how you're uh, processing this, but if you'd like to take a, a longer look at this, it is available um, through, it was published through the Delaware Weekly Crop Update, so you can see it in the October issue, um, and it's also available here at my lab website. And this particular trial, we had applied at V8 on a couple treatments, and most of these were applied at R1. Uh, which is usually that timing that gives the biggest bang for your buck as far as, um, and there actually was just a question that popped up that for gray leaf spot, is there a V6 to V8 fungicide application that's efficacious? So what we see most years is that at V6, V8, gray leaf spot really isn't active yet. Um, so when you're putting a fungicide out at that time, uh, we don't necessarily see the biggest return on investment. Um, but again, scout, you know, if you happen to be a year where you're seeing gray leaf spot that's moving up the canopy, uh, typically what I look for is when we're approaching that VT R1 time frame, I want to keep an eye on my ear leaf and see how far is disease creeping up the canopy. And at this particular trial, at that R1 timing, our gray leaf spot was still two or three leaves below ear leaf. So, um, you know, if you have 
disease that's moving within um, those, uh, sorry, another question popped up there. So if you have disease that's moving up the canopy, just keep an eye on where you're at. And as you start approaching that ear leaf, um, that's when you wanna start having, um, thinking about some of those fungicide applications if you need them. All right. All right, Alyssa, you have about four minutes. Okay. Um, if it's okay, Kurt, I think we actually go until 9.30 and had 10 minutes for questions. So I'm gonna- We actually have a 10 minute break built in between 9, 20 and 9.30. Okay, sorry. All right, well, I'll try to, I'll wrap up here. So a few things then um, with, just to keep an eye on, we did have a new disease that was around this year, curvularia leaf spot. Um, so this is one that can look very similar to young gray leaf spot, but it tends to stay these more circular lesions. Um, and especially if you hold these up to light, then you can see them. And so in our Warrington irrigation farm, this was a corn on corn trial. We had uh, much higher disease pressure um, because of that corn on corn. And we also had curvularity here. So I um, did some ratings on this one. Curvularity doesn't respond as well to fungicides, it seems. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind, this new disease, it didn't show up until about R3. Um, so we really weren't anticipating that we took any yield hits from that one, um, but one to keep an eye on and, and that we'll keep an eye on for future years. We did also this year have a trial where we were looking at Inferro um, products. So the new Zyway product that's gonna be launched from FMC. And so we were looking at uh, some low rates, higher rates, uh, Zyway in combination with Ethos, and then compared um, to some of our V7, V10, and R1 timings. And from, uh, from this one, you can again see gray leaf spot ratings at 14, 28, and 42 days. Um, and then this AUDPC value, what that is, is an area under disease progress curve. So that's a season long, uh, kind of combining all those ratings, um, giving us a metric to compare disease. And all of our products were working um, better than the control, which ended up as an AUDPC of 215. Um, and these infra products were actually working quite well from a disease control standpoint, um, right there with some of our R1 timings. Uh, so this is a really, you know, kind of an interesting finding from this year, and we'll be continuing some of this in furrow work uh, in future seasons. I'll give you another disease just to keep an eye on. So tar spot is a disease that's been moving from uh, out in some of the, the Corn Belt region. It was found in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania in October of this year. We haven't seen it in Delaware or Maryland yet, but since it is in Pennsylvania, this is just one I wanted to give a little a shout out of a disease to monitor. Um, and um, it has these little black spots. So that name of tar spot is um, those little black spots and it is hard to scratch those off with your fingernail. Um, so this is one where it's kind of aptly named. Very quickly, I'll just um, highlight a few soybean research. Um, so we did a, some foliar fungicide work in soybeans this year. Um, you can find that through the weekly crop update um, November article. And we also spent some time this year working with um, nematodes and some soil-borne fungi in uh, soybeans. So we were doing some survey work. This was led by grad student Lexi Kessler. And one of the big um, diseases that we've seen this year from a fungal standpoint is diaporthy. And this can cause many different forms of disease, pod and stem blight, stem canker, seed decay. Um, and this is another one of those situations where we have this organism diaporthy that has a lot of different types of species. So we're doing some work to see what kind we have here in the mid-Atlantic. And so far, so far diaporthy longicola has been our um, most problematic. And when you look at this one, a lot of times you'll see these black dots that go right down the stem. And then we'll have um, some sunken cankers. And if you scratch away the bark towards the end of the season, you can sometimes see these zone lines that are etched in as well. Diaporthy can look very similar to SDS. And um, you know, I found this year that there were a lot of fields I got called out to where people thought they may have had some SDS, uh, but it actually turned out to be diaporthy. 
And in the survey we were doing this year, that diaporthy was found in about 74% of the sites we were at. So it was wet this year, it really favored this disease. And an ongoing issue that we have um, is soybean cyst nematode. This is often considered the most damaging pathogen of soybean across North America. It consistently ranks uh, one or two in the, in the rankings across the US. We've been doing some survey work and in 2019, uh, we were out in some sites and we had quite a bit of soybean cyst nematode and root nematode, uh, root knot nematode present. We continued this survey work into 2020 and in about 50% of the fields, we were seeing soybean cyst. We also have a lot of fields with lesion nematode um, and then about half it with root knot nematode as well. Just because nematodes are there, um, they do have to be, you know, kind of at a certain population threshold to start causing issues. And you can see on the right side of this graph, the percentage of fields um, that did have some of those uh, populations above threshold. And the question that I needed to make sure to get to so that you might see this later um, is SCN is often called the silent yield robber. Uh, for years, we have managed this disease by having resistant germplasm. But what's been happening is that um, populations are now reproducing on this resistant germplasm at much higher rates. Um, we're able to do these tests where we can see on different resistance lines. So this is a field where I conducted some trials this summer. And on our PI88788, which is the most commonly used uh, resistance gene, it's in about 95% of soybean germplasm, uh, within my field, those nematodes were able to reproduce at about 65%. If that gene was working as it used to and, and should be, that should be less than 10%. Um, so that's our problem with that soybean cyst nematodes. It kind of creeps up on us. Um, you know, we can go from having not that much to when we get this rapid reproduction, all of a sudden we can have um, high populations. So trying to rotate, um, so corn is not typically a host with soybean cysts. So corn soybean rotation helps out with cyst nematode, um, but with some of the lesion and others that we're seeing there, um, then we need to, uh, sorry, I'm getting uh, pulled off here. I'll wrap up on this slide, um, but I appreciate your time. And um, I will fast forward here to my contact info. If you have any questions or um, would like me to send any of the data from this season, happy to do so. Um, and give some shout outs to some of our funding sources and grad students. And thanks so much. Excellent, thank you, Alyssa. Um, we will now take a quick break. Our next presentation will resume at 9.30.